Greetings everyone, this is Tanya and I Love Iodine. This week's presentation is on an introduced plant known as tansy. Before we get started, a disclaimer. I am not responsible for any injuries or illnesses that result from your actions. You are responsible to do your own research, most importantly use your common sense. This information is brought to you solely as an educational guide with the best of intentions. It is imperative to always properly identify a plant as safe before you even touch it, let alone consume it. Use this knowledge along with quality field guides, other reliable sources, and or a knowledgeable forager to assist you. Also, keep in mind, just because I eat something doesn't mean you should. You may be allergic to it, and I am not. Be mindful of that when introducing any new plant or food into your diet. Also, if you have health care issues that take medications, when you're dealing with medicinal herbs, contact a qualified herbalist and or your healthcare practitioner for further advice. Anyway, this is a close up of this beautiful plant. It's actually quite a delightful one. And of the flowers, as you can see, obviously we're looking at Japanese beetle, so you can get an idea of the size. Japanese beetle is going to be a half inch at best. So these are um, going to be about that size, but this is what you're gonna see close up. This is known as common tansy. Uh, Tanacetum vulgar. Anytime you see the word vulgar, vulgaris, that actually just means common. Keep that in mind. If someone calls you vulgar, they're really not calling you anything more than common and vice versa. Now this plant will flower from June through September depending on where it is growing. Right now we're going to go see it. It's August, the beginning of. So we're going to see how it's looking at the beginning of August where I live, which is in Maryland. And of course that's going to vary from year to year depending on how the seasons go. And this is also called bitter buttons, cow bitter, golden buttons. This is in the family known as Asteraceae. It's also commonly called the aster, the daisy, or the sunflower. Family, you may be familiar with lots of other plants in this, like dandelions, chicory, and of course, the sunflower. As we look here, we're gonna look at some of the different pictures and then we'll go outside and check it out. Like I said, this is non-native. This was introduced here from Europe, but it is very, very common throughout. We'll look at the distribution map in a moment. But on the left-hand side, you can see generally what the flowers are gonna look like. They're rather quite beautiful, flat in shape. And the leaves are gonna be fern-like as they are described. And here's the illustration. This is the distribution, so you might find it growing where you live. It is very widespread throughout North America. This is what the flowers look like when they're starting to form. They're actually um, quite interesting and very glossy, very flat in shape as well. And how they would be described in the Peterson book, they describe the leaves as firm like the flowers to a half an inch, which we saw with respect to the beetle on there, in flat terminal clusters. And where found, it's gonna be roadsides filled. They also say waste areas, disturb sites in different books and scattered throughout the area, which is definitely true. We'll look at some further pictures. This is what the leaves look like before it flowers. So you're gonna find this, of course, and that's oftentimes a good time to collect the leaves. We're not going to use this as an excessive uh, food. We're not making salads out of it. It's more used as a seasoning with respect to edibility and then it has further uses medicinally we'll talk about. As you can see here, it often will have developed the green uh, stems and or the red, I mean, rather, is the color I'm talking about there. Kind of a reddish purple, very common. So you might see it with the greenish stems and then they'll advance to that. Again, learn your plants, don't use rolls. I've heard things like, all oh, plants that have red in them are poisonous and everything without is not. That's actually not true at all. There's plenty of things that don't have red or poisonous and plenty of things that with red and purple that are quite safe. Use your own discretion, use your research, learn each individual plant and know that there are exceptions for every rules. So when you're dealing with safety and foraging, you need to learn the plants. This is a nice picture here on the left-hand side where it shows really prime flowers. You have some of the fresher flowers at the top and some of the ones over to this side are actually just getting ready to um, bud down at the bottom where they're just budding. And so you have the transition. So it's really interesting to see that. This just shows further uh, development of the flowers. So on the left-hand side, they're just forming and then they're in prime in the center there. And as you see on the right-hand side, they are going to see they're, they're dying down. They look like someone caught them on fire and they're burnt when they die, but that's just the way it is. Nobody, nobody burnt them. Maybe this one, I guess, a little bit. Typically, the size of this one is going to be about one to four feet, depending on where it's growing. And of course, the time of year that it's going to flower is going to be dependent upon 
your climate and where you're located and how your season has gone. You know, we had a strange season this year with snow late and, you know, it depends on rain, of, of course. Now, as we spoke about the edible uses, the young leaves spring in the springtime, the flowers in the summer, and you're going to use it as a replacement for sage, you know. So if you're out bushcraft, you catch a fish, you want a little seasoning for it, this is something that could go really well. And it's something that we can find and it's moderately common. I mean, it's widespread, but it's not excessively common, but you definitely will find it. Now use it sparingly. You don't want to use it in large quantities. Also, if you have any allergies to things like ragweed, you might be very mindful about other plants because you could be allergic to those as well. And always use a, like a filled edibility, like safety test. If you're um, not familiar, leave a comment. I can do a little bit of talking about that. Also, this plant, like many others, could cause dermatitis. Many plants do, whether it's the oils or the compounds, you know, or things of that nature. So always be, you know, cautious and whenever you're introducing yourself to new plants. Now, this one is very aromatic. It's very strongly scented. So that's a way to identify it is learning what it smells like. That way, if you encounter it again, you'll be very familiar. Now, if you were to make an essential oil out of this or, or press the oil out of it, a small amount, which is a half an ounce, can kill a person in two to four hours. Do not, you know, do anything with the oil of tansy. It is not something for ingestion. Don't use it as, you know, as flavoring or anything like that. Even a small amount is not going to be healthy for uh, a person. Keep in mind, you know, ingesting essential oils, you might want to, you know, take a deep dive into that and see if that's a good idea. I like to go with the plant matter as it nature intended and rather and been into the concentrated forms. Now medicinally, this has been used for lots of different reasons and as this channel focuses a lot on parasites, this is actually one that can help with dealing with worms and especially intestinal worms because these are one of the most common types of ways to become infected with um, parasites is they're going to live in your intestinal tract. So how you can use it is the leaves. You can make a weak cold tea and you can use it for indigestion, intestinal worms, flatulence, weak kidneys, jaundice, or suppressed menses. Externally, you can use the leaves and the flowers for swelling tumors and inflammations. The leaves have been used as an insecticide and anti-inflammatory. The leaves also have been used to make a spray that's used for sore throats. So in the Peterson book, they describe it as the... Um, using the cold tea so you know what that is and again we're talking an infusion because we're dealing with the soft plant matter we're not dealing with the roots so we don't want to do a hard boil on that and whenever they also say use an inhalant of the tea for sore throats as well and experiments have confirmed that tansy is antispasmodic and antiseptic so that's pretty cool the oil is lethal and that's where i got that information from so keep those things in mind. We're going to go outside, check it out, see what we got going on at this time. I really love the, the Japanese beetles on there. I thought they were really cool. Also, if you want to get the illustrations and the maps that I use in my presentations, a lot of them come from the USDA plants database. Please check it out. All photos in this presentation are mine. So if you want any information on that, please reach out and let me know. All right, well, let's get outside and see what we got going on out there. Now we're outside. It's the beginning of August 2022. We can see what tansy is looking like. We're in the flowering stage. It is a summer flower, a perennial. It will be back. This is the stage that we're at. We're a little past prime as far as collecting the flowers. As we see, these are already starting to turn brown and go into their seed formation. Get a little up close on that so everyone can see it and then we were going to look at the leaves down here again the very fern like much different though than you're going to see with a carrot or the yarrow um just be mindful whenever you're learning plants there are some deadly species out there this one is known to cause dermatitis so some people i have never had an issue the other way to identify this besides these very characteristic uh flowers is it, the smell i mean it's very sagey, very pungent, very interesting. It's not sweet at all. It's definitely not something you would add to a dessert or things of that nature, but it's a seasoning. So that is how it is used for edible purposes. And of course, you know, making a, like a cold tea 
is how they would prepare this for using for medicinally or use it externally as well. This is not one where we're going to be using like a poultice or anything of that nature. Uh, typically because of, especially with the oils, we don't want to really kind of concentrate any of those. We do know that the oils are a little, you know, A, causing dermatitis, and B, you know, we don't want to make an essential oil out of this one. There is cases where they do use it for different purposes, but never ingest it, okay? Anyway, if you haven't, please subscribe. If you can, give it a like. That would be really awesome. I would really appreciate it. Stay tuned. There'll be more videos out every Friday. If you want to stick around after we're done here, I'm going to go look at the elder from what we saw last week and see where it's at uh, a little bit later on. And we'll talk about some of the other plants that are out here. It's always good to know what's growing around. And of course, we do have our blackberries growing here. We have a locust tree. We'll slide on right by him or her. We have a lot of Canada thistle. Really wish I would have gone out and got rid of that. Guess I'll have my work cut out for me next year. Ah, so this is getting kind of nice. So you can definitely see that we got still a lot of the green berries. But we got this cluster here that's ripening up rather nicely. Of course we still have, considering where it's at, eh, we still got some time. I will, I'll keep coming out every few days. That's the thing with the things that are ripening. You might think, well this isn't even that ripe. And if you wait a week, then you've already missed it. So do maybe if you can check things, you know, early few days if possible. As you can see more of the blackberries, I think I'll come out in the morning and do some berry picking. And down here, of course, we have our wild carrot. We have more elder growing here. The berries are what they call it. It's become common to call the whole thing elderberries, but that does seem very dismissive to the elder flowers. But you do what you do, and it is okay. So down there in that marshland, there's quite an interesting array of things. I'll definitely get down there and check that out. Anyway, it's good to get out there and see your environment. It might seem like there's just a bunch of weeds out here, but it's not true. There's actually a bunch of cool species growing, albeit we do have some honeysuckle there. Those are invasive, unfortunately. We do have some medicinal uses though. We have lots of goldenrod growing out here. Here is a great plant for bushcraft. Makes good cordage. It's known as dogbane. Do not eat it. It is toxic. But you can make cordage out of it. And don't mistake it for common milkweed. These have these cool seed pods. Pretty cool plant. I like it. We've got autumn olive growing here. It's not seeding though. That's another invasive, but it does make nice berries, make good for jelly, like roll-ups, you know, fruit roll-ups out of it. And here we have another big cluster of elder growing, and then down to those getting taken over, unfortunately, by the Canada thistle, so something definitely needs done. A lot of deer sleep through this region, as you can see, the grass laid down, that's because they pack it down, there's a lot of deer in the area. Here we have some docks. Ah, oh, broadleaf or curly. We'd have to look at the leaves. There's a little bit of both through here. Now we got some of the goldenrod that's getting ready to bloom. We got some sumacs down here. Look at all those staghorn sumacs. Make some sumac aid out of that. Good stuff. Yeah, there's lots of really cool things out here. It's a very interesting area to come check out. It's always good to go out into your area and learn the plants. It's always very important. You never know what the situation could be. It may save your life if you're out hiking and you get lost. If you can actually give yourself a little bit of sustenance, it might make all of the difference. Also, it's free food and it's a good offset to the inflation that we are experiencing. I expect it won't get better before it gets worse, but I'm not a predictor of anything. All right, well, peace and love, everybody. I hope that this was able to give you a little bit of information and see what some of the plants look like when you're out and about. Of course, there's more plants out here that have awesome uses than we just spoke about, but let's not try to get too overwhelming in too short of a period of time. It's good to just learn it a little bit at a time if that works for you. It'll all start piecing together. Yeah, we got some good stuff growing out here. Yeah. Anyway, peace and love, everybody.
Take care.